I couldn't download oh, the. No, don't be up here. No, it's confusing. Don't worry about it at all. Uh, how long am we gassing on for? So I. Uh, twenty to twenty-five minutes. Is that enough? Too long? I don't know. I mean, you know, okay. or maybe we'll see. I'll go on until <laughs> till the, till the sunset. Uh, but. I, <laughs> Okay, everyone, welcome uh, to Food Talk Live. A reminder that this episode will also appear on our podcast, uh, Food Talk with Danny Nierenberg. So please sign up wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, I get really nervous every time I have to introduce Dan Barber because I feel every time I, I do it, I, like, I've done nothing with my life compared to him. <laughs> so um, Dan has been a really, really great friend to Food Tank and to me, and he's um, done so many amazing things. But he is the executive chef and co-owner of Blue Hill and Blue Hill at Stone Barns in New York. He's a James Beard award-winning chef and a fierce sustainable food advocate. He recently co-founded the seed company, Row 7 Seed Company, to bring new innovative varieties of vegetables out of restaurants and into the larger food system. He has written uh, and spoken widely about sustainable agriculture, health and nutrition, and food policy. And he is the author of a book, Every Food and Agriculture, uh, anyone who's interested in food, food and agriculture should read, entitled The Third Plate. He is also, like so many chefs and, and restaurants, had to pivot very, very quickly during this pandemic by starting a program called Resourced to support the independent local food movement during the crisis and beyond. And again, he and his brother have been really great friends to Food Tank, and I'm always excited to talk to him. Dan, I, I hope you don't mind, before we start, I've uh, been doing these live casts since, you know, uh, we've all been locked down. And um, I, I just want to share with you and our listeners how inspired and grateful I have been by this process of listening to experts like you and so many other people. Um, the, it's you know a crazy time for all of us. So in addition to being a little bit scared and nervous, sort of you know constantly, uh, and often really angry at our policymakers for doing lots of things and not doing lots of things, I I have been really really grateful to be inspired every day. Um, uh, this is something that all of us are going through globally, and I think you know there's a lot it can lead to. It, it, real positive uh, change in how we treat our health, how we treat our food, uh, how we treat the environment, and how we treat everyone around us. So uh, I, I just want you to know that these live casts aren't always perfect, and I don't always ask the right questions, but I'm grateful to people like you and our viewers and our listeners who've been giving me feedback. I mean, yesterday I cried doing one of these because I was just so moved by a story out of New Orleans. So um, there, there's a lot of ways that people are trying to make a difference through this. So I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to have you and, and on the show today. It really means a lot to me. Thank you, Danielle. That's a very, very heartfelt opening, and uh, I hope I make you laugh today I make you cry I, I don't want that to be the goal you know I will say no. it's very hard to to talk about some of these issues that I know are on your mind and on my mind on a lot of people's minds uh, about the food system about where do we go with this and what has this yeah. taught us and and in a moment of as you so eloquently said desperation that um, uh, unsteadiness, uh, loneliness, yeah. danger. It's, it, it is hard hearted to start talking about the future and what the food system can look like. And for farmers, when down the street from where I'm talking, there are people that are, are dying in the hospital and right. three hospitals surrounding us in, in Westchester. And they're all uh, like most hospitals near metropolitan areas are, are really struggling. And so this is a, 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 a an enormously comp Flex moment, and um, you know, I hope that you don't feel, and and I, of course, I'm speaking for myself, that we don't get lured into only the moment, which is where all of our hearts are, but start thinking about uh, in this time that we're in, can we imagine uh, how to circle out of this in a way that is um, uh, that is better than what we had before, and that that I don't think goes against. Uh, being sensitive to the moment. So I'll, that's how I would set the frame of our talking. 
Yeah, I know. I love that. And I love like all of the words that you've been using, like imagination and like what, what can we gain out of something that's truly so awful, right? And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with looking for the silver linings. And, you know, I've been talking to folks like uh, Kathleen Finlay at Glenwood and Dan Glickman, you know, former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. And, and almost everybody I talk to says, you know, this is the time to really change how we think about our food system. So, uh, you know, you, you think about these is issues constantly, whether you're in the kitchen or on the farm. How, you know, what are you thinking about the opportunity for local and regional food systems to thrive, not only during this emergency that we're going through, but long after? Well, I would say going along the, the theme of hard heartedness that that what COVID has done so indiscriminately uh, is exposed weaknesses uh, everywhere in, in our bodies, in, in, in the food chain. And, and no one has been spared, really. Uh, and I would just want to shine a, a light and an uncomfortable light on the farm to table movement, uh, because that too has been exposed by this awful pandemic. Uh. Not the resilient, uh, future food system that we all imagine is possible because yeah. it turns out that it has a very weak link. And and if yeah. we had been talking four weeks ago, we would have said the strongest possible food chain in our workings and even in our imagination has to be a farmer shaking the hand of the person who's purchasing yeah. the, the produce uh, that was grown by the farmer. I mean, that's as direct and as uncomplicated and as pure as can be. And it turns out that in, in, in a nanosecond, that whole idea, theory, but really a statement of fact, gets erased because you can no longer yeah. shake the hand of the farmer that's growing your food. And with the restaurant behind me that is closed, I can no longer service those farmers. And with farmers markets all over the country closing or being very limited in how they can um, sell to the public, well, all of a sudden, that model is thrown into real question for, for answering some of the problems that we have with the big food chain. Um, right. So if I were to distill the, you know, the, 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 the idea for a calculus moving forward, it's to, it's to answer that question is what, what does, uh, how do we circle out of this in this reset moment? Uh, and imagine a food system not to be nostalgic. We, we ought not to be nostalgic about uh, the farm to table movement you know, of, of a month ago and where it was headed, which was, you know, encapsulating the most exciting social movement in America and looking very clearly like big food and big agribusiness was on the decline. And the numbers were, were saying that people were, were leaving the, the supermarket aisles of processed food and anything that had too many ingredients in it, anything that looked right. too processed and too, too agribusiness related and was headed towards, you know, the movement that we care so deeply about. So that was that was cut to its knees quite quickly. But I don't know that the answer to circling out of this is to return to that moment because what this right. shows is that moment wasn't as strong in 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 conception uh, of feeding people and a food system moving forward as we would have imagined. Yeah, it's ironic, right? I mean, you're right. If we'd been talking two months ago and we you know imagined what this pandemic or another one would look like we would have said what you exactly said, you know, our local and regional food systems and the farm to table movement, that's where it's all at. But now that you literally can't shake your farmer's hand anymore, how restaurants like yours, which are really, you know, focused on building community and creating that social connection, uh, how do you, you know, imagine surviving through this? And I, I know it's a really blunt question to ask, and I would, you know, be so sad if, if restaurants like Blue Hill didn't make it through the other side of this. So how do we, how do we figure that out? And I know you, you've done some ideas already with, you know, this sort of restaurant in a box kind of uh, idea through resource. But what, what, I mean, when we're, when we're so focused on community as a movement, when, when we don't have that community coming together, wh what do we do? Well, I, and I don't have the answers. I'll tell you, I have more questions than I have answers. And I sure. um, I have more doubts. The only thing I don't doubt is the doubt. Uh, I think that's a quote from Philip Roth. The only thing I never doubted was the doubt. That is, that's Philip Roth. It's a great quote because I really feel that now I, 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 every day, doubt a lot of decisions that I made two and a half, three, three weeks ago. Uh, when three and a half weeks ago when we were closed and, and every day we're making decisions about 
how to maneuver in this very um, unstable and, and unknowable environment. And what we decided to do was close the restaurant even before we were told we had to, which, which mm. I'm glad we did. We felt it was not the right thing to be doing. Uh, we, we terminated the employment of 170 plus employees that, you know, it took a lifetime to build that, you know, it, what's get lost in the conversation of restaurants and I won't dwell on this, but what gets lost is when he said restaurants will come back and they'll rebuild. Well, sure. I mean, you could open up a restaurant with, and just hire anybody, but 20 years of, of, of building sort of a reputation and a, and a, and a, and a community of people with the knowledge yeah. and that many people have been here many more than three and four years and they now have scattered all over the world actually and so to rebuild right. that is daunting and and that's the loss for me was you know there's so much sadness all around for me the personal status which is the, the, i had gotten to a point in my career where where you 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 build a community that that is thriving and so to see that wiped away as a lot of these chefs saw it is just just heartbreaking but but in response, we, we decided to launch a program called Resources. Really, honestly, it, I want to say that it was all thought out and we had all these, you know, food system ideas in mind. But sure. I, the truth is, when I woke up in the morning, I was just like, there's so much food in the walk-in and in the pantry and and from so many amazing farmers that to walk away from that and, and, and not do something with it, it seemed crazy. And so we started donating to these local hospitals and and then we were creating these boxes and we got a little bit more connected with the boxes and then we launched it as as a, a way to preserve employees so we sold boxes and and now that's that's really matured in three weeks and it's, it's, a, it's a new business and and we're retaining a certain number number of employees and we're donating uh quite a bit to school children uh public school kids who are no longer receiving lunch from the public schools and and hospitals uh in westchester and new york city but I'm saying all of that to make maybe even a larger point, as if there has to be a larger point. But but it's that uh, it's that what I have what I have under, learned is that you know if I, behind me is is we now have 20 cooks working on this box program, but we're not a we, we're in a restaurant kitchen which three weeks ago was serving customers as Blue Hill, but now we're we're a we're a box production facility, and actually more to the point is we're a processing facility, yeah. and. You know, I, over in that corner are are two cooks that are cleaning this morning's ramps and and fermenting them and pickling them for the season. We have somebody in that corner who's breaking down a pig from Blue Hill Farm, and we're going to start a sh some charcuterie with it and some curing and fermenting, and we're going to sell some cuts that are uh, raw cuts. And over there in the corner, I've got another. Um, guy who's milling some wheat from storage that we're, we made into a bread program. And my point to you is that, you know, is that maybe this is one answer for the, for the, for the, for the way that the farm to table movement ought to, ought to mature. And that's, and that's really about it needing a few more middlemen after all, you know, one of the yeah. strengths again of the farm table was, was get rid of the middleman or the middlewoman because that's where, everything gets so uh, denatured and, and the right. money doesn't go to the farmer, it goes to the middleman, you know, and the processor and whatever, the delivery. And, and, and when, they, when they get in the hands of the processor, you know, the quality goes down and the nutrition goes down and it becomes more fraught and more energy is sure. used. And every possible negative has been attached to processing. And now that I'm in the world of food processing exclusively, I can only say that you know, the processes that, that human civilizations, different cultures have worked out over thousands of years are unbelievable. Uh, I knew that when I was in the rest. I knew that charcuterie and, and, and fermentation and malting and distilling and uh, uh, cure drying and, and um, uh, pulverizing dry. I mean, all of these processes, cheeses and, and whatever, they're all, they've all, I was doing them all in the restaurant, but it was in a busy traffic and transit context. Sure. Now I'm focused on it. I'm just like, you know, this is this is what the regional food economy needs. Is is we need more middlemen. We need more processors. And yeah, what would yeah. have happened had we had that in place at this moment? I think, uh, and maybe this is a way to prepare for the next moment because surely there will be one. Yeah. Is that local farms would have an opportunity and an infrastructure to deliver their their produce and their goods in a way that value adds in every possible sense. When I say value adds, I mean values of what the farmer is actually bringing because of the quality that they're bringing it in, soil health on, on up. 
and and that the nutrition actually becomes improved, not denuded. Um, so that you know, in the fermentation process, as we know, we're adding microbial activity that is makes yeah. the food more bioavailable to us and more delicious. So if the the problem with the 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 negating the food processing is just the American conception of what fruit, food processing is. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be that way. Uh, and you know, that's um, that actually is complicating the farm to table picture. It's it's making more chains. It's true, and we always said. The simplest way is a direct chain, but but as we now see, maybe that's not so right. And a complicated uh, chain means a system and a, a regional system to take produce and meat and grains and make them value added nutritionally, sure. deliciously, and and from a revenue perspective for farmers. So that's where my mind is right now. Anyway, sorry for the long answer, but it's no. I I, I think that's so interesting, and I mean I think that's something that I. You know, you know, before this happened, when we when we all would get together and talk about food loss and food waste, preserving and processing, you know, things that we, you know, words that we often didn't want to use in the food movement became yeah. very important. And like you know, looking down on frozen food or canned food or, you know, is not the right way to think about it. It's how do you improve nutrition? How do you preserve this food? How do you make sure it's, you know, shelf stable for people when they need it? And I think, you know, that's what we're all sort of learning now that this is uh you know, something we should have been thinking about before. How do we prepare yeah, for emergencies? And, th- and thinking about it, you know, there are people thinking about it. It's a question of does the culture value it? And that's where we probably could, chefs in particular, could spend more time taking the expertise that we already do in the kitchen. I just want to stress, I'm not relearning much uh, from the right. processes. I'm just concentrating on them and backing up and saying, these are processes that have been worked out over hundreds of different cultures over right. thousands of years. And they're they're amazing, actually, and they're very uh, low tech. Because um, that's the second lesson from this catastrophe is we knew this before, but we only get to reinforce technology as the answer to an improved uh, ecological food landscape and uh, and a nutrition landscape and an efficiency landscape. It's just not the answer. It never was, and it never will be. And if, if this right. doesn't expose it, what will? Uh, they, 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 what we need is more biological systems, more complexity, but put the cultural imprint on the kind of processes that can improve food uh, and give value to the farmer. I mean, that's, that's the thing, because the farmer has to have value in the process. Um, yeah. So there's a wonderful quote from, from Jack Algier as a farmer at Stone Barn Center. And he said, it's, it's you know, farming, farming right on through. And what he's talking about is that, it, that the farming value doesn't end with the drop off to the to whatever nice. the customer whoever the customer is so it doesn't have to be direct to the customer to cook at home because asking people to cook raw ingredients at home to to solve the puzzle of a food uh, a, a, a sustainable food system isn't the right isn't the right message even yeah. as we're all staying home and cooking more now we know that's not the right message so we need to yeah. complicate the picture in a way that values food and values the the right kind of farming yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think, you know, more complexity or complicating the picture, as you just said, that that sounds reasonable to me, but I think that scares a lot of people, right? Because they yeah. want simplicity, but th- there's yeah. nothing simple about this problem and there's no simple way to, to solve it either. That's right. No, I'm, I'm yeah. looking right outside my window here is the, is the Stone Barns uh, vegetable garden with some grains and cover crops and that's being planted uh, in these in these weeks now, and what you what you just looked at is a very complicated system that is not right. solved by uh, technology. Technology is so linear, and what what we don't have a language for is what I'm looking at here. It's a biological system, and that should instruct us uh, in an illustrative way of how we ought to think about the food system that handles that complexity. And really, right. it's about mimicking the complexity so that there is overlap and quote, unquote, inefficiencies, so that when in times of disaster, those inefficiencies become very valuable for the quality uh, of food delivered. So that's that I think is the goal out of this. That is so well put. That is so well put. And I mean, this is, you know, unlike uh, other natural disasters like hurricanes or flooding, 
this isn't going away anytime soon. So there's no sort of emergency food aid or, you know, dropping in food to people. This is something that we have to think over the long term. And I think there's a lot of benefit in that, you know, it, and it's people like you who are spreading this message about understanding complexity and, and making sure that, that folks understand that, you know, food was never, it was never supposed to be simple. It was, it yeah. was always supposed to be very that's, complicated. That's really, well, that's really well said. And that's right. We have a language for, technological fixes. It's in the Bill right. Gates and Steve Jobs vernacular. Right. We don't have a language for biological complexity. We don't. Uh, chefs do. No, chefs do, right. and it's called flavor, because flavor is only yeah. true flavor, like jaw-dropping flavor, the kind of thing that you want to come back for more of. It only comes from a complex and inefficient biological system, because mm -hmm. biology is inefficient. I'm talking to you, looking at you with two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, uh, and that's because biology is inefficient uh, and there's overlap and there's overlap sure. always for good reason. And the, the way that gets expressed is through flavor and nutrition. And that's why rebuilding our food system with a nod towards deliciousness is not an effete uh, goal. It's, a, it, it's actually at the cornerstone of what we should be doing because deliciousness is like a soothsayer, as you know, and, and it and it guides this process. And I'm now arguing based on my maturation over these last three weeks, that part of the process should be processing. And we ought to figure out how to inculcate these kind of processes that have evolved over cultures over thousands of years in ways that become yeah. uh, part and parcel of the eating culture for the future. And that's, that's, that's a heavy cool. lift, but it's an exciting one because it's more delicious. So I think there's some motivation there. Absolutely. And and that sort of leads me, I know, you know, people are not only cooking more than ever before, but you have this renewed interest in people growing food at home. And I know you started row seven, not just for chefs to get better vegetables into their restaurants, but for consumers to do that as well. I'm sure you're seeing an uptick in sales of seeds. I, you yeah. know, you tell me. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, the, the, the the right it's it's 10x and and it's true for every seed company it's people wanting yeah. to take control because what you part of the fear and the anger that you expressed earlier is just lack of control it's just right. uh yeah right and so the best way one of the best levers we have is we vote with that kind of control three times a day and that's a very powerful thing and so being able to plant something in the garden is is a good start you know we're, we're starting a, a program that's gonna be announced next week and i'll tell you before before we kick it off the ground, I hope that doesn't. Um, I hope I'm not saying anything out of turn because who knows if it, it it's could could go sideways. But so far, we're looking like we're going to launch this thing called um, the Kitchen Garden, and we've taken nice. few cooks who are out of work and they're planting a garden right around the Rockefeller old Rockefeller estate here. We, Jack uh -huh. Alpine, the farmer, has identified three pristine pieces of grass, manicured grass uh, that's part of this property. And we're gonna we're gonna dig it up uh, with three cooks. We're gonna rip into the sod wow. uh, and plant a 15, 10 by 15 small little kitchen garden with three really terrific young millennial cooks. We have three, but they're from all over the world, and they have three very different perspectives on seeds and on food and on 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 cooking. And so we're gonna follow this story for the next several months with their gardens. Uh, and Jack cool. is going to write up a recipe for how you plant a garden with you know no raised beds no fencing this is down and dirty it's some water and some seeds and that's it but you go Love after it. the lawn and you know it's i'm really excited about it the way it's been turning out it's, it's been amazingly interesting to to watch these cooks get engaged in their little piece of land uh but what what is more is that just to frame this in the larger context which is your work is that this is a dog fight now you know the 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 farm table movement has been 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 not shattered but hobbled uh, during this moment, and big food is is doing just fine, if not better. The food executive I talked to this morning would would probably make you cry because what he's saying is, you know, we were we, our our story was the end of our story was being written a month ago. We did the decline right. sales were so fierce uh, that it was looking like like agribusiness or big food was going to change dramatically for our generation. That's completely flipped yeah. on its head now, completely. And, and what he said very, very strongly and, and I thought frighteningly was, we're not gonna make the same mistake again and we're gonna bring the resources to bear. We know a millennial market that's much more sophisticated and we have the resources 
to dig into this in a way that we're not going to lose. We're not going to try and lose. We're not going to lose this market share. That's what he said again. And if that's wow. true, that is frightening. So it is it is a dog fight. And that's where the idea for this kitchen garden came up. We take three chefs. All right, so I'm, I'm calling chefs all around the world. I'm like, give me your cooks. Go out, find a piece of grass and plant it because it's kind of a refugia moment. It's to say, yeah. we won't allow this. Uh, and right. we won't open our restaurants and come back to um, a, a lack of choice that we have before we open. And that's what we're facing, yeah. unfortunately. These, these farms are headed to some serious troubles in the next couple of months if we don't call attention to it. So thank you for Absolutely. all the work you're doing because you're, you're helping bring that attention. Oh, uh, I don't know about that, but thank you. But it, it is terrifying. And so, you know, you live in, in, in this beautiful place in, in upstate New York, in the Hudson Valley. Uh, are you scared most for the farmers? Are you scared most for the restaurants? Are you scared most for the eaters? Who, what, what scares you the most about all of this, Dan? It's like whack-a-mole. I, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm very fixated on the, on the farmers because the small independents uh, are headed into reality that when I when we've been talking to them, we now have a survey going, by the way. It's on, we're now at, at 80 plus farmers in the survey. Uh, we want to get to about 120. And we're, we're looking at small uh, independent farmers that are either going vegetables, grains, meats, or we, we started talking to fishermen, uh, day boat fishermen. And what they're all saying essentially is they're okay for the moment. Some are doing quite well at the moment as we've mm. been reading about because of hoarding and because people are just more sensitive about what they're buying. But if you project a couple months into the future, if you ask a very pointed question, I've learned so much about a survey. I mean, surveys are, I will never read a survey in the same way because you could simply get the result you want by the question you ask. It's very it's fascinating. That's why there's a real science to it. I'm not, yeah. this isn't my shiv. But, but, but when you ask a very sort of innocent question, tell me, farmer, what, give me a snapshot of what it looks like if I tell you that come August, there's a 50% decline in farmer market sales based on social distancing. And there's more than a 50% decline in restaurant sales based on, you know, restaurants not coming back and based on the yeah. public not really in the mood to spend money on the kind of food that we need them to spend money on for the kind of movement that we're talking about. And so far of the ones I've talked to, 90%, maybe a little bit more, uh, have said they're bankrupt uh, at that moment. So that's that's August. It's not it's, you know less than four yeah. months away. Uh, yeah. And and you know we here we are talking about uh, the the farmer saying, well, what you just said. I'm not anticipating. I'm think markets will be back, and I think I think restaurants will be back, and then I'll be okay. But that's not happening. And so yeah. I'm going to publish the support or get it into the hands of people like you quickly to spread the word because we can all say with this nostalgia, right? Or 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 you know. Um, lovingness that boy this is really gonna hurt the small farmer but unless we have the data to support it i don't no longer than this conversation so we're going to try and get that out there in the next couple of weeks there have been some other people doing great research and we're trying to make this into a composite research report that shows Fantastic. a devastating near-term future if we don't do something quick yeah I mean, and this year is more important than ever because it's a big election year. So getting that, that data into the right hands or intelligent hands, I think will be very important. So thank, I'm glad, I'm so glad you're doing it and I'm excited to, to see where that goes. So I, I asked you what scares you most, what, what inspires you the most right now? Oh, you know, all day I'm spent, I feel like I'm spending my time as most people on looking at bad news and, and in this new business of resource looking at bad news, but I weirdly feel optimistic be only because of this moment where yeah. the things that we're talking about don't get heard um, unless there's the kind of crisis we're talking about. Yeah. And now the question is, you know, do, do you seize the moment? And, and do you stand behind the boldness of ideas? Because if we're not bold in the ideas of how we move forward, then we've lost an enormous opportunity. Uh, and and that's what I feel excited about is can you be bold in presenting ideas and and yeah. can we force that uh, as uncomfortable as it is and especially this moment with everything going on hard to talk about in, in ways that 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 you know that capture the attention but but can we move out of this in bold ways and that's to me that feels very inspiring my, my wife always says I'm all, I'm always looking for the hole in the donut but I'm like I don't feel that way now and I, I think she's proud of me or something. I don't know. 
Working That's on. so great. That's so great. I know. I mean, as scared as I am, as nervous as I am about, you know, where Food Tank will be in August, along with all the farms you talked about. But mm. like, I feel really excited. And I haven't felt this way maybe since, you know, I was in my 20s, like excited, about like where this will take us and the, the future of this. And there is enormous opportunity. But we, you're right, we have to be bold. We have to take on these challenges. We have to be uncomfortable, like asking really difficult questions and questioning ourselves. And, and you know, you like you said, you've changed your mind so dramatically over the last three weeks about how, how things have been, you would have handled them. I think we're all doing that. And it, it is really uncomfortable, but that's the only way to get through this. Yeah, I think that's right, to dig in. And so here we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've taken up a ton of your time. I want to tell people that they can go to bluehillfarm.com and the stonebarncenter.org as well as row7seeds.com uh, to get more information about Dan and all the incredible stuff they're doing with Resourced and, and other projects. We'll have those uh, websites on uh, our website, foodtank.com, and on social media. Dan, I, mean, I don't know what to go this ahead. Is so, this is such a treasure to have you know, you taking the time to hear from different points of view and distill information and you really are a, a treasure. So keep it going. I admire you so much. You are my inspiration. You stay well. The world definitely needs you. Um, a reminder that we'll be back here at 5 p.m. Eastern when I'll be interviewing uh, Luke Saunders, the founder and CEO of Farmer's Fridge. Thanks so much, Dan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.